and uh, ask you to turn to that if you have your Bibles handy. Luke chapter 4, and the message is entitled, Good News. Good News. It seems like in 2020, uh, good news and 2020 just don't go together, do they? Uh, that, was, that was a big statement uh, before I heard that the first doses of COVID are coming along, because that's great news, isn't it, for, uh, uh, for us in America in this year. Uh, but it's also good news for the rest of the world because America is not keeping this to themselves. We're planning to go around the world with this vaccine. As uh, we take a look at good news this morning, let me invite you to stand in honor and reverence of the reading of our Lord's Gospel. And uh, we'll begin Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that, that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. The next two sentences are <clears throat> Luke's whole reason for his gospel account and for recording this particular part of the gospel. It says that everyone spoke well of him. In other words, they were kind of pleased with what he read and how he read it. And they were amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. Couldn't believe this was Jesus, the son of Joseph, speaking. And here is the punchline. How can this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? The reading of the gospel of our Lord for us, the people of God. Thank you. You may be seated. How can this be? We always have questions, don't we? I want you to imagine for a few moments this morning that this is not Randolph County, that you're sitting in a church that is located in a little country backwater hamlet on Long Island. The name of your town is Hopog. I'll tell you how to spell that way. You come to church, and although you haven't seen me in quite a while, here I am. You knew me as Rusty, the janitor's kid, brother to the school's basketball star, Tom. You knew that we lived on the other side of the tracks, dirt road. Not much chance of being a mover and shaker there. Without so much as a how do you do, somebody hands Rusty the scripture reading for that day. It's Isaiah's announcement of the good news, and I read it in a voice you never heard out of me growing up in the 1950s. Something different. Now that wouldn't be completely strange. I mean, we welcome guests here, don't we? We welcome visitors, we make them feel at home. But then, the janitor's son takes the teacher position at the pulpit after reading, and what he says is, what I just read to you, it's all about me. My question is, who's going to be the first to call the bishop? <laughs> Anybody from grabbing a rope and heading out to the oak tree? And at the very least, you might ask, boy, when did you get so uppity? You were a nice kid. You were never much trouble except for that one BB gun thing on a Halloween night. Where do you get off telling us that God put you in the Bible? That was the atmosphere, that 
day in the synagogue as Jesus read the words of Isaiah and then told them that they were looking at Isaiah's message standing before them. He was the good news. It was an announcement that everything was about to change. Indeed, it was a fact that everything had already changed. It changed 30 years before in a little stall filled with straw. One starry night. Rewind back to nine months before that stall in Bethlehem to an angel announcing to Joseph. Joseph was somebody of the social status of Rusty's father, the janitor at Hop High School. That God's Holy Spirit, this is what the angel was saying, to God's Holy Spirit is going to overshadow Mary. What he's going to do is he's going to implant within her a child that would be the Savior of the world. That activity of God overshadowing by his spirit, Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus, that activity connected humanity and God together. And folks, that is the good news that we talk about this morning. The sound of the Christmas angel is a chorus of good news. Now, to satisfy some issues, once we get past the issues of humanity and immaculate conception and how can a virgin conceive and give birth and how a carpenter's kid winds up as savior of the world, beyond all of that, we have nothing but more questions, don't we, about how is this good news? We're familiar with that it's good news. The fact of Jesus' birth is good news. But exactly how? What is there about this news that makes it good news? The answer lies, I think, in a twofold perspective. Real simple. First of all, it's God's message. God is the creator. He's the provider. He's the sustainer of all life. His nature is love and joy and peace and truth and gentleness and kindness and long-suffering and forbearing and everything else that we call the fruit of the Spirit. That is God's nature. And anything that he has to say is worth our attention. It should be worth our attention. So it's God's message. But further than that, building on that, it's not only God's message, it's God's message that we can receive. We can get it. We can assimilate it. And we can build a life upon it. Gospel account tells us that Joseph was just an average fellow. He was an underachiever at best. And he died young. Mary, that was his uh, betrothed at the time, she was an unmarried pregnant teenager. You ask the question, You've probably heard the answers many times over the years. What kind of trouble was Mary in? Well, as a teen in that culture, she certainly wasn't even old enough to speak for herself because legally she belonged to her father. Technically, she was not to speak in public or to be seen in public without her veil because she was property of her father, and that's what fathers demanded of their children in those days, the female children. As a female, she had no rights in that male-dominated society whatsoever. Uh, She couldn't speak up, and she couldn't sign a legal document. She couldn't even give a witness in court. She was a legal non-entity. And as a pregnant, engaged teen, a betrothal, she was at least apparently of misconduct. She was serious enough to call for the death penalty. That's right. The young lady got pregnant out of wedlock before being married. It was the death penalty. They believed that uh, it was so grievous a sin as to take her out to the edge of town and pick up stones and hurl the stones at her until she died. So the message came to Joseph. The message came to Mary. And the message was also directed to shepherds, socially and religiously unacceptable, smelly shepherds. I don't know about you, but I've been around some sheep. They are cute in pictures. They are defenseless. They're totally without aggression, but they stink. I mean, they really stink. Uh, And those who lie down with sheep, to borrow an expression about dogs, 
get up with a distinctive air about them. Shepherds were like that. Shepherds were outcasts. Shepherds were uh, not to be trusted in any way because they lived a rough life. After all, they never went to church. Why? Because shepherding was 24-7. So, to the least successful of Earth's inhabitants, a man who was an underachiever who died young, a young girl who was pregnant but not married, and shepherds, the outcasts on the outside of town doing the chore that nobody else wanted to do. To these least successful of Earth's inhabitants came the sound of a Christmas angel, <clears throat> a song of good news. Hear the words of Isaiah one more time. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. We haven't heard much this year, have we? He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. There have been an awful lot of brokenhearted people whose loved ones have died, and that's broken hard enough they weren't even yet to bury them for months, if you remember what's happened this year. To proclaim freedom for the captives. Let me ask you, do you feel like captives? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you feel like the Lord is favoring you very much? And the day of vengeance of our God. Well, vengeance and 2020 kind of go together. To comfort all who mourn. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. There's been a lot of despair in our community, in our county, our nation, around the world. There's been a lot of despair. But the good news is a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. The sound of the Christmas angel is a chorus of good news. It simply was not just good advice. It was an announcement something worth listening to. It is God's message, and it's something that we can receive. Good news is uh, a wonderful thing, is it not? If you were alive at the end of World War II, uh, the surrender of hostile forces to the Allied countries, that was good news. The discovery of a polio vaccine a couple of generations later was really good news. We await the announcement of the end of AIDS and SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, cancer, and of course, COVID-19. Any of those things would be the stuff of good news. We recognize the announcement of good news, the meaning, but what of it in terms of meaning? What does happen once good news has been announced? We hear this every Advent. We hear this every leading up to Christmas time. Good news. There's even a song. Good news, 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 good news. Well, let's think back again. The news of the end of World War II was good news because it meant that the troops were coming home. Families would be whole again. Body bags would stop being shipped home. The news of a polio vaccine meant an end to the horror of mothers and fathers who would hear the doctor say that arm or that leg is never going to be used. The good news of an AIDS or SIDS or cancer or COVID-19 cure would mean that death has been cheated again. The question before the house this morning is this. What of the meaning of the good news of the Christmas angel? We connect up those certain events that have occurred in our lifetime, the end of World War II, the end of the Korean War, Vietnam, and the end of uh, this or that, or the other polio, and so on and so forth. But what about that news that's so good? What about that news that the angel delivered to a nobody like Joseph, to a non-entity like Mary, to the smelly non-entities out on the hills watching their sheep. What are the meaning of that? Is there any difference that this good news makes in our lives? And so here's the point. I want to place before you this morning the Bible's uncompromising message of faith and hope, that the good news of the Christmas angel is above the end of a world war. It's above the discovery of great medicines. It's above the successes of any political 
policies. The good news spoken by the Christmas angel means that God has heard the cries of a lonely, a forgotten, and a sinful world. And more than just hearing, God has given. That's the good news. And because of his giving of his son, the Lord Jesus, John 3, 16, where God so loved us that he gave to us his only begotten son, that whosoever, you can fill in the blank there. Because of that, we can find meaning and hope and life can be filled with peace and assurance. You ask 20 people on the street in 2020 if their life is filled with peace and assurance. Is their life filled with the good news? The angel, the angel said to this frightened pregnant teenager, Mary, you have found favor with God. The word is charis, that word favor. Many times in the New Testament, this word is translated as grace, the unmerited favor of God. Something that you didn't deserve, you got it anyway. You didn't even ask for it, but it appeared. The Bible dictionary calls this word the divine influence on the heart, which is reflected in the life. That doesn't mean you put a smile on your face and you always walk around with that great big smile. That's not what it means. It means that when it happens, when grace comes to you on the inside, it shows up unmistakably on the outside. Not so much in how big you smile, but in the way you live your life. It transforms you. The word charis or grace or favor had its origin in a basic word that means to be cheerful or calm about life's conditions. You know people who, in the worst storms of life, look calm and unaffected by it? Now, I'm not talking about this kind of look here, you know, where they're just missing the point altogether. I'm talking about a calmness that you can't explain. What is the expression that we find in the Apostle Paul about the peace that passes all understanding? It's something the world really doesn't understand. So the Christmas angel is saying this to this real little girl in trouble, pregnant, unmarried. The angel is saying, listen, there's every reason to be calm. God is smiling and he wants you to smile with him. I have to confess that in the part of Russell that is quite cynical, <laughs> my response if I were married would have been something like, yeah, right, check it out. <laughs> I'm engaged, I'm not even old enough to date, and you're telling me I'm pregnant and Joseph's going to buy it that the Holy Ghost did this. <laughs> Big fella, you do not understand the real situation. You don't understand the trouble, the trouble I'm in. What have I got to smile about? And this morning, you might be here with some of those same uncertainties about life that Mary carried around. You might be worried if the mortgage is going to get paid or whether it's going to be your job that's going to be phased out next time. You may be thinking Christmas is coming and there's too much month left over at the end of the money as it is. Or your marriage is in trouble. Or the doctors just use the C word, cancer. And preacher, you want me to smile because there's a God who's smiling. I want to uh, share what uh, another man by the name of uh, Tom Allen, who is a pastor, but also a former armor, army ranger. Tom Allen wrote this about the movie Saving Private Ryan. If you've watched the movie, it's not for the faint of heart, it's very gory, it's a war movie. And uh, the setting is like this. Uh, Private Ryan is in the theater in Europe and he is fighting and uh, he's got several brothers who also enlisted in the army and all of his brothers have been killed. And so the army in a bow towards the compassionate side sends a bunch of army rangers after Private Ryan to extricate him from the battle so that his parents will not lose all four or five brothers. I can't remember how many there were. And this is what Tom Allen, who is a former ranger, says about the movie. He said, 
Quote, I was extremely proud until the last minute of the movie. As the movie, as the movie began, I was proud watching the Rangers take Omaha Beach. Then the story begins when they receive a mission to go deep into enemy territory to save Private Ryan. They had skirmish after skirmish, and some of them are killed along the way. They finally get to where Private Ryan is holed up, and they say, Come with us. We've come to save you. And he says, I'm not going. I have to stay here with my guys because there's a big battle coming up, and if I leave my men, they're all going to die. What do the rangers say? They say, we'll stay and fight with you. And they all stay, and they all fight, and it's gory, and it's hard, and almost everybody except Private Ryan dies. At the end, one of the main characters, an officer, played by Tom Hanks, is sitting on the ground. He's been shot, and it's mortal. He's dying. And Private Ryan leans over to him to talk to him. And Tom Hanks, the officer, whispers something in his ear. And everybody in the theater is crying because Tom Hanks is shot. And Tom Allen, the one who wrote this, said, I was crying because of what he said. He was so terrible. Private Ryan had bent down, and Tom Hanks says, Earn this. Earn this. The reason, he wrote, the reason that made me angry is no ranger would ever say, earn this. Why? Because the ranger motto for the past 200 years has not been earn this. The ranger motto for the past 200 years has been sua spontea. I chose this. I volunteered for this. So when Private Ryan bent down, if Tom Hanks was really a ranger, he would have said, Sula Sponte, I chose this. This is free. You don't pay anything for this. I give up my life for you. That's my job. And Pastor Allen likened it to the cross. This is what he wrote about it. He said, so when you look at the cross and you see Jesus hanging there, what you do not hear is earn this. You ever stop and think about what Jesus was thinking about? The suffering was from early in the morning till shortly after noon. That's a long time for just seven saints from the cross. What was he thinking all those other times? Was he looking at you and me down through the annals of history and saying, you better earn this. Is Jesus saying, I'm giving my all for you, you better earn this. Is that what he was saying? Pastor Allen writes this. Sua sponte. That's what Jesus was saying. I volunteered for this. You don't have to pay anything for it. That's the end of the story as Pastor Allen wrote it. I had this thought that said, earn this creates the fear of unreasonable expectations, a weight that no person can bear. What did the Christmas angel say? What did Jesus say so many times? In Greek, it's phobeo, fear. But he said it in the negative, fear not. Don't fear. Do not be afraid. It's the opposite of our normal fearful reaction to the calamities of life. God's message from the Christmas angel was, relax. Everything's under control. There's good news here. It's all good because God is here. So what is the meaning of this good news? No matter what crisis that you face today or tomorrow or an eternity of tomorrows, this Jesus Christ, born so long ago, the God who became man and lived and died among us, this same Jesus Christ is smiling and he knows how to meet every need and care and fear that you have. Listen, the only requirement that Jesus ever wanted to place on us in order for him to be our brother is that we have the same father. Simple as that. The sound of the Christmas angel was not simply good news. It was the best news this whole world has ever heard. To all of the anxiety. Is there enough anxiety in the world today? 
and even leading up to Christmas, to all of the fear, is there enough fear to go around in the world today? To all of the stress, some of you have stressed out just underneath your masks. To every discordant note of hell, the Christmas angel announced the holy message, God has said, enough, my son is born, and I'm happy, smile along with me. Father, the angels get their cue from you, and scripture tells us they all rejoice when even one sinner repents, changes his mind about who you are, and comes into the fold of your forever family. Lord, we are so grateful in the season of Advent to prepare our hearts to celebrate that act of forgiving grace. That act that we can receive as a gift of heaven, whether we are a president's daughter or a janitor's son. Salvation and the invitation to call you our Father. For the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives because of Sua Spontea. It was your choice to bring us home. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.